And uh, our next session is a very different topic now. We're going to talk about one of the groups that perhaps we've heard less about uh, during the pandemic, but that have also had one of the major impacts. And I'm extremely grateful to uh, Chris Hatton and Mary McCarron, uh, who will be presenting um, from some research both from the UK and from Ireland. I'm sorry we're running a little bit late, but um, I think we can also squeeze 10 minutes more into the next one, not to cut you short, if our colleagues from New Zealand are okay with that. So thank you very much, and the floor is all yours. That's great. Thank you, Adelina. Um, Professor McCarran and I are going to talk mainly about two projects um, in different countries which have been tracking the experiences of people with intellectual disabilities um, through the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm going to, um, always an anxious moment, share the slides, share my slides. Um, so hopefully people can see that. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Excellent. So I'm going to provide a little bit of background in the UK and then something about the project that I've been one of a cast of thousands um, in. Um, so some background, um, COVID has not been kind to people with intellectual disabilities in the UK, I think it's fair to say. Um, we're good on um, evidence now, um, we're not so good at doing things with that evidence. So we know from a range of projects that people with intellectual disabilities are twice as likely to have been infected with COVID-19, that's in the first two peaks of the pandemic in the UK. Consistently, people with intellectual disabilities have been between three and four times more likely to die of COVID compared to age and gender match controls. The peak age of death is much younger for people with intellectual disabilities than it is for people generally, um, generally around 55 to 64 years. So in terms of thinking what that means in terms of kind of supporting people, that's really quite significant. Um, we know from a couple of analyses that living in a place with a lot of other people, so kind of communal establishments, puts people with intellectual disabilities at higher risk of dying from COVID-19. And it seems likely that so far over 2,600 people with intellectual disabilities in England alone have died of COVID-19 and people are still dying um, now. Um, so this is this is my only graph you'll be relieved to know. Uh, this shows um, the number of uh, deaths of people with intellectual disabilities who were flagged in hospitals and had confirmed COVID deaths each week over the course of the of the pandemic. And you can see that there are clear and huge peaks um, at the time when there were general population peaks in people dying from COVID. But I'll just alert you to the right hand end of the graph. Uh, most of this is after um, England had its uh, Freedom Day, when uh, most, if not all, restrictions were lifted. And we can still see there are consistent numbers of people with intellectual dis disabilities who are dying from COVID now. In terms of social care, um, and I was, uh, I mean, as I heard a bit about in the previous session, um, I mean, I've got, I guess it depends where you are in, the, in your perspective, but social care policy and guidance has been focused on older people in residential care homes in England, although we've heard that took, so, you know, a while to kick in. And actually, it's a tribute to the um, LTC COVID website that that was brought, brought to public attention, actually. Um, but in England, 95% um, of adults with intellectual disabilities who are getting long-term social care are not older people in care homes. So policies focused on older people in care homes are going to miss the vast majority of people with intellectual disabilities. At various points, there was what was called easement of social care legal responsibilities. And people have consistently told us that um, guidance for people with intellectual disabilities um, living alone, people living with families, people in supported living, and for those who are supporting people with intellectual disabilities, that kind of official government guidance has been slow and not always seen as helpful. There, I'm employing my English understatement. In terms of healthcare, um, healthcare responses, um, and these have mainly been documented so far for the first COVID-19 peak, I think we can safely say they have been discriminatory for people with intellectual, di intellectual disabilities. The, uh, um, 
have been repeated reports of blanket do not resuscitate orders where the proper legal processes have not been gone through. Um, so 73% of people in 2020, people with intellectual disabilities who died of COVID had a do not resuscitate order. Once in hospital with COVID-19, people were less likely to get intensive COVID-19 care and were more likely to die, even though that they, they'd got as far as hospital with COVID. We've seen large scale withdrawal of specialist therapy and primary care for people with intellectual disabilities at times when the, the NHS is under COVID-19 pressure. So the, the effect of that pressure on intensive care and kind of mobilising a workforce for COVID has been withdrawal from things that many people with intellectual disabilities really rely on. Um, and there was a real struggle to prioritise people with intellectual disabilities in the UK for the COVID-19 vaccine. Although the good news is that COVID-19 vaccine rates are now pretty good. They're now 90% or more for most groups of adults with intellectual disabilities, but they are still lower in younger age groups and among people from some minority ethnic communities. So that's a bit of background. The project that I want to briefly whiz through um, is a project tracking people's experiences and support throughout the pandemic. So we, um, we asked people how they were getting on at three points. Uh, wave one, this is wave one of the project, which is terribly confusing, I realise now, when we're talking about waves of COVID. Um, wave one of the project was last winter when we were going into um, a lockdown um, and there was uh, a peak of deaths. Wave two was in the spring of this year when we were emerging from lockdown. And wave three was in the summer of this year, mainly after Freedom Day. Overall, in what we're calling cohort one, we did Zoom or phone interviews with about 500 adults with intellectual disabilities who were um, amazingly patient and stuck with us through the project. Um, and we also got online surveys for 300 people from family members and support workers where the adult with intellectual disabilities would not be able to take part in an interview. And there's a link to the project website there. Um, I'm a joint PI of the project, but actually it was a massive enterprise across multiple universities, multiple project partner organisations, without whom none of this um, would have happened. And that's our standard disclaimer, read it quickly. So we've got five headlines. Um, first, um, people throughout the pandemic have been doing their bit to keep themselves and others safe. They've, acting, they've been acting responsibly, unlike some other people we might mention. So in terms of vaccines and testing, um, altogether by the summer, 10% of people in cohort one, that should be in 13% of people in cohort two, are reported to have had COVID-19 at some point. Over 90% of people had had both doses of the vaccine by the summer, and pretty much everyone said they were willing to have a COVID-19 booster vaccine. Um, and also a lot of people were doing regular lateral flow testing um, in, in the main, um, mainly before going out or because everyone where they live gets tested. People in cohort one were doing the tests themselves, but people in cohort two mainly needed some help to do that. People are also complying with all the lockdowns and the social uh, restrictions as well. So people have been really responsible um, through this, and you know, so they're they're, do, they're definitely doing their bit. So eighty eight percent of people in cohort one, who are the people who we spoke to, um, and fifty six percent of people in cohort two, who are the people with kind of greater support needs, where we've got surveys, were wearing face masks. Some of those people were people who were officially exempt from wearing face masks, but they wore them anyway to keep themselves and other people safe. Even by the summer of 2021, we could see substantial numbers of people, uh, family carers and support workers were still using some form of PPE when in close contact. So provision of that kind of uh, personal protective equipment needs to continue. And in terms of how people got their information about COVID, it was television, television news. Um, that was by far the most common way that people in cohort one and family carers and support workers in cohort two got information about COVID-19. Particularly for the people with intellectual disabilities, it wasn't government websites, it wasn't government inf information, it, 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 was, it was the television. So people have been doing their bit, but you know, as many people have been, people are paying a price for this. 
um, in the summer, half of people who we spoke to were worried about leaving the house. And that had actually got worse since the spring, um, which is something that I'll come back to later. Um, over 20% of people were often or always anxious, and we had sort of similar figures for kind of feeling sad or down. Nearly 20% of people in cohort one and 28% of people in cohort two were reported to have a new or worsening health condition in the four weeks before we spoke to them or they surveyed us. So there are new health conditions um, arising or worsening health conditions. Remember, I talked about the kind of withdrawal of health services. Um, earlier. Over half of family carers and support workers report general feelings of stress, tiredness and disturbed sleep. These are really high levels that have stayed high and are not improving over time. And 14% of family carers or support workers had contacted the GP about their own health in the four weeks before they, um, they sent us the information. So people are being responsible, but people are paying a price. It's also obvious that support in many ways has not returned to pre-pandemic levels for people with intellectual disabilities. So in terms of health services, around a third of people in both cohorts had been in contact with a GP surgery in the last four weeks. That's fewer people that said they used to visit their GP regularly before the pandemic. And most of that contact was by phone. And that hadn't changed much between wave two in the spring and wave three in the summer. Of those who are waiting for a planned medical procedure, which would be a test or an operation or a hospital outpatient appointment, between 39 and 56% of people have been waiting for more than six months. So there, you know, so there are real issues stacking up here for, for people. And of those people who usually have a what's called a learning disability annual, annual health check, so every person with intellectual disabilities in the UK on the GP register are eligible for a specific annual health check. 38% of people in cohort one and even fewer people in cohort two, 32% had had their check in 2021 by the summer. And that doesn't seem to be increasing very quickly. In terms of social care services, um, generally support hasn't returned to pre-pandemic levels here either. 20% of people in cohort one and 48% of people in cohort two, and though that's the cohort people who have greater support needs. They both say they're getting less service support um, now in the summer than they used to get before the pandemic. Some people are, are getting more, but not as many as those who are getting less services. And support has shifted a bit. It means going out less, that should be, and it means being online more. For people who said they had a personal budget, um, for more than 30% of people, they said their personal budget was being used for services they were not currently getting. And for 36% of people in cohort one and 42% of people in cohort two, they said the person or their family were paying for some services out of their own pockets. So clearly there are real kind of financial issues about what's happening here. And the biggest gaps between what people used to get from social care and what they were getting in the summer of 2021 were in day services, community activities, contact with social workers, short breaks or respite and further education. But there were some things that where there was consistent support all through the pandemic pretty much. Personal assistance or support workers helping at home and also going out of the house with personal assistance or, or support workers. So that support was there all the way through when other forms of support seemed to fall away. And it looks like the position is worse for people in cohort two with, the greater, with greater support needs, that their social care is less likely to return to pre-pandemic levels. I want to talk about um, Freedom Day in England when restrictions were lifted. And there's a real issue for some people with intellectual disabilities here, where the lifting of restrictions generally means a more restricted life for some people. This is a really big and it's a continuing issue for people with greater support needs, particularly people with profound and multiple intellectual disabilities. So in the summer of 2021, 19% of people in cohort two were still shielding. So that's basically being kind of shut off from, from the world. Um, and at this point, people were getting no support for shielding at all. That, that had stopped because COVID had finished. 
For 55% of people um, in cohort two, continuing restrictions on people being able to visit and kind of being, being able to be in contact with people were reported to be having um, a negative impact on the person. So family members talked about kind of people's worlds shrinking and becoming much smaller and people just kind of losing their zest for life um, over the course of, of, of the pandemic. And for a lot of people, so 24% of people in cohort one, 30% of people in cohort two, it was not felt to be safe enough for them to go to all the places they used to. So people are still hanging back. And the final headline really from this for me is that COVID is not over, um, which might seem an obvious thing to say with Omicron or however it's pronounced. I don't know. I need, I need, I need to learn my Greek. Um, five percent or fewer people reported that their life had gone back to normal by last summer and at least three quarters of people were reporting well their life would not get back to normal maybe next year maybe later maybe not ever interestingly over 80 percent of people in cohort one and the family members of support works in cohort two thought that support workers should have to have the vaccine to work with the person so they were strongly of the opinion that COVID vaccines should be uh, mandatory for support workers. And we asked people, what would help you feel safe to go out of the house? People most commonly reported that reinstating the kind of public health measures which we had before, face masks, social distancing, and also low local COVID case rates would help them feel safe to go out. What does this all mean? This is my final slide. You'll be relieved to know, Mary. Um, this is what, what one person with intellectual disability said to us, I don't even want to hope. So what does building back better mean in that context? Many people and families feel, and this has been really consistent throughout, that they've been forgotten and abandoned through COVID-19. Managing to survive on no or little support for an extended period of time doesn't mean that people don't need support. So some people are starting to say, um, well, my local, um, my local council has said, because I haven't had that service for a while, I don't need it anymore. What are we going to do about people and families who are still shielding or stuck inside? That group of people can't even see a path to a better future. They can't see how this is going to end um, in a way that's better for them. And interestingly, some people were saying, actually, one of the good things about the pandemic was that first I got more kind of connected digitally with all sorts of people, but also it gave me a chance to kind of rethink my routine. So there were some routine things that I did that I actually didn't like very much. So this could be a really good chance for people to reset how they want to be supported. But having said that, that isn't an excuse. And what people are wary about is that that's an excuse for cuts or saying online activities are the same as what people had before. My last question is really quite straightforward. I think it's fundamental when we're talking about sort of the policy and the practice and the technical aspects of supporting people. Services are really going to have to rebuild trust. That's really a fundamental starting point, I think, um, to move towards building back better. So um, that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. And now we're going to hear from Mary McCarran speaking to us from Trinity College Dublin. Beautiful background. Thank you, Mary. We're running a little bit late, uh, so we don't um, I think our colleagues from New Zealand maybe can have a bit more coffee <laughs> uh, as they <laughs> join us. Apologies for the delay. Thank you very much, Professor Mary. We cannot hear you yet. We can see the slides, so. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Angelina, and thank you very much, Chris. Uh, I think there will be a lot of similarities indeed in what I'm going to present, some differences, but indeed uh, many similarities. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the experience of people with intellectual disability from the, in Ireland. And I'm just going to, to provide a little bit of context for you in terms of what I'm presenting. This is the Global Family of Longitudinal Aging Studies which have happened all over the world. 
And Ireland was probably one of the first countries to include people with intellectual disability in the family of global aging longitudinal studies. None of these aging studies had previously included people, but we were lucky to get government support in Ireland and uh, a coalition of the willing together to mount a study like this. This is the very large conceptual framework that underpins the study that we are doing. So this is a study using the same protocol as for the general population, but we included some different domains, particularly the social domain, to capture issues that were important in the lives of people with an intellectual disability. But we have huge information on physical health, cognitive health, psychological behavior, healthcare utilization, and the social domains. And this information was really helpful to us in terms of campaigning and working with government here in Ireland to encourage the movement up of people with intellectual disability, particularly with respect to the vaccines, and most recently also with respect to the booster campaign. So we uh, started IDS till in 2007, and uh, Chris is on the Scientific Advisory Committee, so he's well familiar with it. And we have been continuing to, to uh, roll it out over many years. Um, we will be going into the field for wave five in 2022. So that could be 15 years of health data and social care data on this population. When we were out in the field for wave four, the COVID pandemic uh, struck. And uh, we, you, can, you can download the COVID report from wave one of IDS tilde we went back out to the field in May of 2021 to September 2021. Our first data that we collected was in May 2020 to September 2020. Our second COVID survey, which is a much larger survey, many items uh, similar to uh, what Chris has, has collected as well. We, we, we joined up our thinking around this and we, we will be presenting that report in January 2022. We had hoped actually to present it in December, but uh, many of the services and people with ID that we want to be involved in this report are under extreme pressure, pressure in Ireland at this moment because the COVID rates here are extremely high. And we are back in now to another system of, 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 of various types of lockdown. So at a community level, uh, it is not good here. And uh, we have uh, as many people now with COVID as we had uh, back in, 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 in February, nearly uh, 2021. 20, uh, so, so this is concerning. But I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what we have found in the first COVID report. And I'll so give you some insights into what appears to be coming through now in the second COVID report. So, IDS Telda, we have randomly selected 10% of the total intellectual disability population in Ireland, aged 40 years and over. Tilda for the general population of selected people aged 50 and over. So this just gives you a profile of the population that we are looking at. You can see the gender distribution, you can see the numbers. We have followed about 750 plus people. All levels of intellectual disability are represented. Um, etiology of ID, including those with 19% with Down syndrome and all types of living settings. So that just gives you an overall feel of the population that we have been following. And it's this population I'm going to present some data to you on with respect to, 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 um, to, to COVID. Um, we were able to look at the prevalence of chronic health conditions, and we know that having many of these chronic health conditions either predisposes you to greater uh, risk of poorer outcomes and higher mortality should you get COVID. So having this type of data was really important because we were able to feed this into public health here and to get people with intellectual disability more, uh, particularly moved up the, the vaccination uh, schedule. A bit like what Chris has said, people with intellectual disability, certainly in, in, in time one, there was a high levels of compliance 
to the guidelines um, with, with, with over 60%. Um, and uh, there was a plan if people tested positive or had symptoms to isolate. So even from the very beginning, there was a degree of preparedness within ID services in Ireland to respond. And we had a very different situation with respect to what happened to people with ID in Ireland versus to the general aging population who are in long-term care settings in the nursing home care settings, where their outcomes, particularly in wave one of COVID, was really, really much worse. So I'm going to present really the findings from wave one and just a little bit of wave two as well. So as I said, it, it, the, the survey, phase one survey, the data was from May to September, 2020. Phase two is May to September, 2021. And it's interesting to see what has changed. 10%, the 18% of the population now have presented with symptoms. Uh, at, at, at time two. 75% um, of people had been tested at some stage for COVID. This is the green now you can look at. Tested positive, 12.3% had tested positive. So 63 people had tested positive out of the sample that we were looking at. Uh, hospitalized, 12% of people were hospitalized. Um, 10% had moved residents, and this was moved residents to be in a safer place or, or to, to isolate. And sorry, I'm not sure if this is blocking your view, but it's blocking my view. And uh, over the three waves, up until May, September 2021, we had three people that have died of COVID, which was really a very small number from a sample that was really quite old, almost a lot of chronic health conditions. We definitely know that one out of those three died, got COVID and died unexpectedly from COVID. Uh, the other two people who passed away had COVID, but both were at end stage terminal illness as well. Um, just the impact of, of, of COVID, and I know Chris has spoken a little bit about this, um, uh, so though the 66 have tested positive, you can see the, the, the gender distribution, uh, also the, the age distribution, more slightly more in the 50 to 64 age group, but the numbers here are small. Um, those with mild or severe intellectual disability were more likely to present positive than those in the moderate range of intellectual disability. Those with Down syndrome were somewhat less likely to present positive than, than those with ID from other etiology. And those living in residential care or community group homes were more likely to present positive than those living independently or with family. And Chris spoke a little bit about this in terms of the, of the type of settings and, and, and the larger settings. In phase one, in wave one, in the earlier phase of the pandemic, we've seen that those living in community group homes were less likely to present positive. But in May to September 2021 in Ireland, the level of community transmission was just so high in this country that it was very, very difficult to present people who were living in community group homes. And here again, you can see here uh, the numbers, the duration of symptoms, which we thought was interesting as well, um, uh, one week, and then the numbers have presented with symptoms for, 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 for greater than, than one to two weeks and above three to eight weeks. And we know that long COVID is anything from one to four weeks. So we'll be looking at that data in, in greater detail. And again, looking at, looking at health behaviors, uh, what we were really seeing here was that um, uh, in, terms of, in terms of people compliance, and this was, I was interested to know, over the course, we could all be good for a period, but as things, uh, you know, moved on and we had prolonged lockdowns, really, would people be able to sustain this effort? And again, here you can see that maintaining social distance outside your home, almost 60% of people washing their hands to continued with, with many of the, the, the COVID gu guidelines. Uh, 
both in terms of using the hand sanitizers, washing hand hygiene, um, uh, using face coverings and wearing a mask when outside home. So, so this was really, I think, relatively uh, very good for people with intellectual disability. And some of them were exempt from having to wear masks. Uh, and, and yet the, the level of mask wearing really when you, you when you think about it always and often and sometimes indeed is, is is quite high for the population at large in terms of vaccination and i know um chris spoke about this and this was may to september um, um fully vaccinated and partially vaccinated so you're nearly talking about 100 percent of people were, were were really vaccinated and we have started to roll out the booster campaign and as far as I can see there's the same level of uptake um, 30 percent experience some type of side effects and these really what people talked about tenderness or reading not, nothing too major feeling tired fever headache were, were the most common type but nothing other than those but of course we do know that people with intellectual disability one of the big issues is that sometimes they're not able to self-report side effects. So, so, you know, this may not necessarily be an absolute true uh, um, uh, report on, on, on what had happened. Uh, Chris talked about uh, the, the, the changes in healthcare during the pandemic. And, and this is again from the data we have collected from May to September 2021. Um, got less medical care than usual, about 25% of the population. Really, the level of sedentary behaviour and sitting down and less physical activity are worrying. So we are now seeing, I'm running a national memory clinic for people with ID, and it is really interesting the level of things like cognitive frailty that we're seeing. How many are really trying to unwrap whether this is dementia, whether this is 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 COVID related, uh, etc. So it really is interesting. But we are also concerned about the level of physical frailty, and we're seeing. And I think we have five of IDS tilde. We may be able to see the impact on health on things like falls and fractures and all of these other issues, which we do think is increased. And again, cancelled healthcare appointments. Uh, Chris uh, spoke a little bit about this. You can see here almost twenty percent had medical screening test uh, 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 cancelled. But 18% uh, of people didn't have their annual health check here either, Chris, and participants is 65 and over were more likely to miss their health check. So the older you were, the more likely, which you would have thought it would have been the other way about, around, but uh, this is what we had found. And stress and anxiety in, in, in wave one, which was, I remind people, May to September 2020, 55% of our population reported stress and anxiety. And these were the issues that were causing the stress and anxiety at the time. So for people living independently or living with family, really not seeing, um, not seeing family and not seeing friends was the big issue. For people, oh, apologies, I'll just go back there. Uh, feeling lonely for people living in, in community group homes, um, uh, again, not being able to do the usual activities and not seeing friends. Uh, so there was a kind of a slight difference in terms of whether you're living independently or living in community or living in residential care, but not seeing friends, not being able to do the usual activities was the biggest issue and feeling lonely. And we were interested to see as, as people, as the lockdown continued and, and COVID remained, if this increased. And we see here that almost 70% of people now have reported feeling stress and anxiety. And again, this is the sources of stress and anxiety, not being able to do usual activities, not seeing family or friends, and the isolation. Um, there, uh, I suppose, some of the big issues, and obviously, I know Chris has spoken about many of these are still not back to accessing the the type of life or the type of programs that they they're still shielded in 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 probably many ways. 
Um, and also in, in, in wave one, again, people did say that there was good things and some positive things reported during the pandemic. And Chris has alluded to this as well. Chance to do new activities, greater chance for rest and relaxation, more quality time with staff and using technology to communicate. And certainly in earlier waves of IDS tilde, we would have reported that really the technology advancements appeared to bypass people with an intellectual disability and they were seen to, to, to not really access technology. So this was a positive thing. And this is what people said, keeping people locked down is keeping people safe. These are quotes from people with intellectual disability. I learned a lot. Physical health has been very good during lockdown. I lost some weight. Activities such as arts, crafts, colouring, this was not done. And now I enjoy doing these activities. And again, as we move to the, 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 the latter phases, these were still some of the positives that people were reporting. Participants said the virus didn't really impact on, on her life. She was grateful that life had slowed down. It's nice and relaxed. And I think Many of us would also say that those as positive aspects of COVID that we all enjoyed and, and it took us, uh, it made us just uh, slow down a, a little bit. It's been all right. I'm very content. We did loads of fun things. I played my accordion a lot. We did the Jerusalem dance challenge. The Easter Bunny visit. I'm a very positive person. I'm going to, I miss going home at weekends, but now I can go home after the virus. I did lots of activities during COVID, COVID writing, colouring, dancing, playing basketball, swing ball. It wasn't a bad time because I had my friends around and I had the support of staff. So having that support network of family and friends and staff was very important to people. So again, just very, uh, very uh, minor uh, 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 Conclusions that I just really want to report and pretty similar to, to what Chris has said. We've seen high rates of testing. There's increased rates of infections in Soviet one with low mortality rates uh, amongst the IDS tilde participants. And the things that place people with IDS higher risk of infection was group living, mobility issues and mental health difficulties. And the worst of COVID were, was really avoided for people with ID in Ireland compared to the general population. And people with ID and family certainly followed public health advice and was a very good response from ID services in terms of planning adherence and guidance. Positives were identified, but many felt stress, anxiety, and highest amongst those with pre-existing anxiety. And now longitudinal follow-up is required to track the long-term impacts of COVID-19. And this will be embedded into wave five of IDS tilde, which we will be, which are currently getting ready and preparing the protocol for, and we'll be moving out into the field in, in 2022, around the summer. I, 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 when I was reflecting on this, maybe a year back, I really thought that the COVID situation would be very different, um, but alas, no. And really, we will hopefully try to assess what the implications of long COVID are and continue to monitor the numbers that get COVID and its related mort mortality. And again, things that I spoke about like frailty, falls, uh, cognitive impairment, but certainly loneliness and anxiety. Again, just thanking the team and the, the various committees and funders who supported this work. And you can download all of our reports, etc., from our site here. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I also wanted to mention that tomorrow we have another presentation from, uh, from the Netherlands, also on people with learning disabilities. It will be at 12.30 UK time. If you can also join us, I think um, Monique will present has been here as well, listening to you too. So I'm um, sorry we don't have time for questions. We're running a little behind. I think the planning of this event was a bit optimistic in terms of how much we could get. And, and I'm, I'm a very soft chair because I, I thought this was so important and rich. I didn't want to cut you off. I feel that uh, like everywhere else, the the, the research and evidence on what was happening with people with 
uh, intellectual disabilities has not been as prominent as should have been. And I'm really pleased that we've been able to remedy that a little bit.